here tonight, visit nativeland.ca. I'll be dropping more chats into the chat or links into the chat box as we proceed. If anyone is interested in attending in person, and I believe virtually they may be held, the caucus groups on Saturday from 1245 to 145, they will be in Sheehan Hall and the Sheehan Hall dining room with Wayne Vivier as the theme for this conference. NOFA is aiming to bring to light the ancestral wisdoms of the indigenous peoples of the global south, including the Aymara, Quechua, and Mapuche people in an agricultural system built on stolen land and the forced labor and exploitation of black, indigenous, and other people of color. This conference aims to center equity within the food system. We could use more equity in this food system for sure. All right, so we've got some organizations listed that are working to center racial equity in our communities. If anyone has any to add, please drop them in the chat. This list is awesome, but it can't be exhaustive. There's gotta be more folks that we can connect with to do this good work. We would like to thank our partner level sponsor, Stonyfield Organic for their constant support of all this good work NOFA Mass and NOFA IC is doing, as well as our partner level sponsors an awesome number of sponsors who help make the conference possible. And we really encourage everybody to purchase something from them and let them know how much you appreciate NOFA Mass's work. And not just our partner level sponsors, all of these amazing supporter level sponsors as well. For those of you coming to the in-person conference, um, bring your soil. Visit the soil health table on Saturday. NOFA mass staff will be available to offer technical assistance and recommendations based on the sample that you bring them. Can't hurt. Bring it, Ziploc bag, label it which field it's in, nice and easy. And last but not least, there's an awesome auction going on. I'm sure there's already a lot of bidding. There's some incredible items to bid on. It's all online. I will drop the link in the chat or you can scan the QR code on your screen if you are interested in bidding. So let me exit out of this. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our host, Stephen Tarum. Steve, you're spotlighted and please proceed. All right. Well, thank you very much, Devin. Uh, and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, so, uh, as Evan mentioned, uh, my name is Stephen Tarum, and I'm a scientist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, uh, which is in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, a research project that's uh, in the works, and um, yeah, I'm talking a lot of, you know, about uh, sciencey stuff. So I'm going to do my very best to, you know, cut down on the jargon and explain things as well as possible. Um, but I'm really excited to be here presenting to all of you. So, uh, along with my boss, uh, Lindsay Triplett, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, we represent a team of scientists from across the country that are interested in microbial predators and their impact on crop plants. Uh, so each of our colleagues uh, pictured here uh, has expertise in a different group of microbial predators. And the first thing we did uh, when we got together was we reviewed the literature on microbial predators to, you know, basically examine uh, what's known about all the individual predators uh, and how these organisms interact with each other and with bacterial prey, uh, and also how they impact uh, plant and human health. We particularly focused on uh, microbial predators in soil, um, and we identified a number of gaps in our knowledge that we felt uh, should be addressed um, so that we could help improve uh, plant and soil health. So this led us uh, to uh, get together and write a, a USDA uh, Organic Agriculture Research and Extension uh, Initiative grant, uh, basically so that we could have a conversation with you and other growers across the country. So I'm going to uh, start off by outlining the, uh, the workshop here. So our goal is to start a conversation with you 
um, so we can understand uh, how we can ensure our science is relevant to your crops and cropping systems. Um, basically, we want to use your knowledge uh, to help us design research questions. Uh, so to start with, um, we're going to be conducting a uh, short survey, uh, basically to give us uh, some more data on, you know, to help us plan next steps. Um, and I'll also be conducting a, a survey at the very end of the presentation as a follow-up. Um, during the presentation, um, I'll be talking to you about soil microbial predators. So what they are and what they do. Uh, and then finally, we want to brainstorm with you about your interest in predators for crop growth, uh, nutrient cycling, and plant health. So uh, there are a few options for accessing the survey. Um, if you have your phones ha handy, um, you can scan the QR code. Um, and also uh, Devin will share uh, the link um, in the chat for the, uh, the first uh, survey. Um, basically, uh, this is a uh, Qualtrics survey um, where we would like to learn from you what you know about soil microbes and microbial predators, um, as well as what you would like to learn. Um, there are different surveys for growers, um, industry representatives, uh, students, and other members of our community. And um, I'll give you about uh, three minutes to complete the surveys before moving on. Even just to break the silence, I gotta, I gotta say, I love these questions. They're oh, really, amazing! Well, they're simple, but they make they're thought provoking. Did you make the survey yourself? Uh, with our collaborators. Okay. It it took it took a lot of uh, brainstorming. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate that. Oh, and I should say, if anyone's had trouble uh, accessing the survey, please let let me know. Okay, so uh, in about another uh, minute, um, I'll move on to the next slide. If you can get microbial networks to make more time so I can learn about microbial networks some more, that would be great. I didn't add that to the to the survey too. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Yeah, can you repeat yourself? I was just saying, if you can get the microbes to make more time, then space and time, so we can learn everything there is to know about them, that would be ideal. Oh, that would be handy. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I just got here. Is there a way to do this survey from a laptop? Um, yeah, so um, Devin shared, uh, so just check in the chat. Um, I, I don't know, uh, Devin, if, if you have to share it again uh, for, for yeah, late he, arrival. Oh, yeah, he just he just did. Great. Oh, Thank amazing. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, absolutely. Um, 
And yeah, if, 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 if you're able to um, uh, fill out the survey um, as uh, you know, I, I move through the um, uh, rest of the, uh, the is, is it all right if I uh, move through the rest of the presentation? Uh, all right, I'll take that as a yes. Okay, um, so you know, thank you everyone that uh, filled in the survey. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna talk, uh, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about plant and uh, soil microbes in general. Um, so as I'm sure you're all aware of, uh, soil contains an immensely diverse community of microbes. And as organic growers, um, you're helping to uh, maintain the health and diversity of these uh, microbes, which uh, can impact plants, um, as well as livestock and humans uh, that uh, consume the plants. So I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how soils can stabilize microbial diversity, uh, but I really wanna drive home um, the fact that long-term informed management um, can really help build soil and plant uh, microbiomes uh, in part to fight pathogens. Now, um, of course, plants and microbes uh, strongly impact each other. Uh, so the microbial community is shaped, uh, which uh, is hugely diverse, uh, both on and inside the plant, is shaped by uh, environmental conditions, uh, the type of soil the plants are growing in, and the immune system of the plant. Um, and in turn, these microbes, and particularly the uh, microbes that are present on uh, the plant roots pictured here, um, impact, impact the uh, growth, development, and stress resilience of the plant. Um, and this compartment here where the roots interact with the surrounding soil, we refer to this as the uh, rhizosphere. Um, this is, of course, um, a very valuable industry. Um, there are a lot of companies uh, that invest a lot of money um, in producing uh, microbial uh, products that benefit your crops and soil. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a wide diversity of soil microbes associated uh, with plants, and these microbes do a variety of different things. Uh, so many microbes are beneficial to the plants. Um, they help with things like uh, nutrient absorption and stress tolerance. Um, of course, we're all familiar with pathogenic microbes, um, including pathogens of crop plants and people, but there are also pathogens of other microbes, uh, including beneficial ones. There are competitors. So these are microbes that don't necessarily impact the plant directly, but compete with beneficial or pathogenic microbes that are associated with the plant. And finally, there's the group of microbes I'm here to talk about today, uh, which are the predatory microbes. And um, as their name suggests, they eat the other microbes. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these interactions in a bit, uh, but before I do, I wanted to emphasize that uh, most of the microbes present in, uh, in soil and associated with plants are unknown. So this is a figure taken from a recent study, um, which was done on a plot of soil in New York. And basically the researchers discovered that a tiny number, 16.2% uh, uh, to be precise, of the uh, bacteria uh, they found were known to science, along with only 8.5% of the fungi, protists, and nematodes. Um, now I'm gonna talk more about protists and nematodes uh, a bit later in the presentation. So don't worry if you're uh, unfamiliar with these terms, but basically uh, most of the microbes in soil haven't been discovered yet. And as a result, there are a lot of interactions between microbes and between the microbes and plants that we still need to uncover. So there are many ways in which microbes can negatively impact each other. Uh, microbes can compete with each other for nutrients, moisture, and space. Uh, they can inhibit each other by producing chemicals or antibiotics that suppress and kill other microbes. Or they can feed on each other. And 
predation is in fact the biggest source of uh, microbial mortality in soil. Now we know there are many different kinds of predators in the soil and particularly predators of bacteria. So viruses uh, can rupture and kill bacterial cells. There are other bacteria that can feed on the bacteria of interest. Uh, there are protists, uh, that's what Lindsay and I study. And these are single cell microbes like bacteria, except they're actually more closely related to animals, plants, and fungi. And, and then finally, there are nematodes, uh, which are microscopic worms. Uh, you've probably heard about some of the pathogenic nematodes, uh, but there are also nematodes that actually feed on uh, bacteria. So one of the reasons we became interested in microbial predators uh, is because uh, findings from a study that was conducted by one of our colleagues. In this study, um, the researchers tracked Pseudomonas uh, cannabina uh, that causes bacterial blight in uh, broccoli and uh, other cruciferous vegetables. And what they did was they tilled uh, broccoli with bacterial blight into, the, into two different soils, um, and they tracked how much of the pathogen remained in the soil over time. So this top line represents one soil, um, this middle line represents another uh, soil, and this is just the detection limit. And what they discovered was, you know, there was variation between the two soils uh, initially, but over time, the amount of the pathogen in the soil actually dropped to a zero. So it was undetectable in either soil. Next, uh, the researchers repeated the experiment, but this time they sterilized a portion of the soil by autoclaving it. Um, and this time they discovered that in the sterilized soil, which is shown in this top line here that I'm highlighting, um, the pathogen actually persisted in the sterilized soil uh, while it declined in the untreated soil. So this suggested there was some biological component of the untreated soil that was reducing the uh, pathogen abundance. And this component was removed when the soil was sterilized. We believe, um, or we suspect that this difference is because of predation of bacteria uh, by microbial predators in the untreated soil. <laughs> um, excuse me. Um, so now I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into the what and why of microbial predators. So what they are and why we're interested in them. Um, but also uh, I want to emphasize that the main reason I'm here is we want to know what you think about, you know, when you see this, you know, how does this relate to your field and to your crops? And what would you like, you know, if you had a dream team of scientists assembled, what would you like us to do? Um, you know, how would you like us to think? So up until now, most of the research um, on plant-associated microbes has focused on the impact of things in the box on the left. So plant tissue, plant genetics, field management and stress and disease on the bacterial and fungal uh, community composition, uh, as well as vice versa. Uh, so basically the impact of the microbes on the plants. However, this is only a fraction of the entire story. Uh, we haven't until recently had the tools to study the black box of microbial predators, um, which can impact bacteria and fungi, as well as the uh, plants that they're on. This is a massive gap in our understanding of uh, plant microbiomes, which we hope to address. Uh, now, microbial predators can have two major impact on, uh, impacts on plants. Um, they digest the microbes they feed upon and release nutrients that are locked up in the bacteria uh, into the surrounding soil. Um, this is a major uh, contribution to nutrient cycling in uh, agricultural systems. They can also selectively feed on uh, the bacteria, and this leads to a variety of different outcomes. Uh, so for one, uh, they can enhance uh, populations of predation-resistant uh, bacteria, 
And many of these uh, predation resistant bacteria can actually impact plant health. Uh, they can trigger the production of beneficial compounds by bacteria. They can also sometimes protect, uh, protect and distribute bacteria through the soil. And finally, they can help to uh, control plant and animal pathogens. Now you may be asking, if microbial predators have such a big impact on plants and microbes, why is nobody using them in agriculture? And it turns out microbial predators are really hard to study. Uh, they're really hard to grow, manipulate, and count. Um, they're hugely diverse in many different ways. Uh, so for example, they vary tremendously in size. Um, from minute viruses that are smaller than the uh, bacteria they infect to nematodes, um, such as the one pictured here. And um, on this nematode, there are these little rod-like bacteria that have been stained, just to give you an idea of um, the size discrepancies between the uh, different microbes. Um, so yeah, because of this, um, and you know other differences, microbial predators often require very different methods to uh, study. Uh, something else, my, the, these microbes will interact with each other. So some predators will eat other predators or they will compete with each other. Uh, and that makes it really challenging to uh, study them. Uh, and finally, the soils that we grow our uh, plants in vary quite a bit and are constantly changing over time. So there isn't really a one-size-fits-all approach to study microbial predators. So I'm going to spend the next few times just ta slides talking a little bit about uh, soils and the importance of soil. So soils, of, of course, can vary in a number of different ways. So you know, aside from the organic and microbial soil uh, components of soil, um, they can vary tremendously in particle sizes. So you can have your sandy soils uh, with the largest particle soils, followed by silty soils, and then clay, um, where many of the particles are the same size range as bacteria. Um, you know, these soils have a lot of different properties. So for example, sandy soil doesn't hold much water and clay soils have very low water availability, while silty soils are the best at holding water. Um, and these properties can impact the uh, microbial um, communities that are present in the soil. Now, if we zoom into some clay soil, so these light brown streaks here represent clay particles, and this uh, shape in the bottom left of the screen represents a uh, silt particle. And these darker brown circles and rods represent bacteria. So clay particles have tightly bound water layers around them, which makes clay sticky. And because these clay particles are large relative to the size of bacteria, individual bacteria tend to stick to the surfaces of clay particles. Um, this can help impact the movement of bacteria through the uh, soil uh, and other microorganisms. Now, if we zoom out a bit, so, these smaller particles here represent silt, and these large particles represent sand. There are large spaces between the uh, sand and silt particles. When the soil is wet, um, it's largely filled with water. But as water is depleted from the soil, uh, the pores fill with air. And this makes pathways uh, through the soil much longer. So this combined with the stickiness of bacteria makes it much more difficult for bacteria and other microbes to move around the soil. So as a result, you eventually end up with these sort of reservoirs of um, microbe in the soil that we believe can be manipulated using uh, microbial predators. And um, these, can, these can reemerge as conditions change. You know, as the soil gets wet, they can move around the soil more easily uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Now, to get to a point where we can better uh, utilize and maintain beneficial predators in soil, 
our group is using a, a variety of different methods to study uh, bacterial predators. So for example, we're using uh, whole microbiome sequencing. That's basically where we sequence all of the DNA in the soil to learn what's there and to get an idea of what they're doing. So what functions are they performing in the soil? Um, we can also separate or enrich uh, specific predator types from the soil. Uh, so for example, we can use size filtration um, to separate viruses from the remainder of the soil. And then we can sequence the viruses to learn more about them. Uh, we can also remove uh, basically plant DNA from samples using methods uh, such as a DNA clamp method that uh, Lindsay and I developed. Um, basically what this does is it removes all the plant DNA um, so that we can get a better idea of what other microbes are uh, present, um, such as protists. Um, we can also use PCR um, to target specific bacteria. So this is basically using a, a method very similar to COVID testing um, to identify specific microbes. Uh, we can use uh, bioinformatics approaches, uh, basically to streamline our analyses of the predators in a microbiome sample, and also to identify you know, microbe, uh, microbiome uh, members that might be predictive of pathogens. Uh, we also have isolate collections, um, which we've built through high throughput uh, cultivation. And with these collections, we're able to do microbe microbe assays to, for example, uh, determine which predators are able to eat which bacterial pathogens. And finally, we're able to observe plant responses to experiments that are invisible to the naked eye using methods uh, such as hyperspectral imaging. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the individual groups of um, predators that each member uh, of our team studies. So I'll talk about some of the ways each microbe has been shown to uniquely impact plant and soil health, but some of the characteristics I'll be describing are relevant or applicable to uh, multiple groups of predators. So the first group of microbial predators I'll discuss are viruses. Now, of course, this group has gotten a lot of uh, press recently thanks to COVID, but many viruses are actually beneficial to humans and to agriculture. So what I'm showing here on the left is a bacterial cell that has been infected by bacteriophages. These are viruses that specifically attack bacteria. And the viruses have ruptured the bacterial cell and been released into the environment so that they can infect other bacteria. Um, they're highly effective at killing bacteria in uh, culture. So what's shown here on this Petri dish is a field of bacteria and these little black circles are areas that have been killed by the uh, viruses. So if viruses are effective at uh, killing bacteria in culture, this suggests that they might be effective at killing bacteria in the field. Uh, however, before we are able to test this, we need to get a better idea of what uh, viruses are even present in the soil. So uh, to help virologists under, uh, uncover what uh, viruses are in the soil, um, we're, they're using new viromics methods, uh, such as I had mentioned uh, size filtration before. Um, and this has uncovered a shockingly high diversity uh, of viruses that vary over time, space, different locations, and different soil conditions. Um, so for example, if you remember earlier in the talk, I mentioned the importance of soil moisture uh, to the movement of microbes. So moisture also has a really strong impact on the abundance and diversity of uh, viruses, as viral diversity is approximately a thousand times greater in wet uh, versus dry soil. Viruses also vary tremendously over space. So as I mentioned before, 
Soil can facilitate or hinder opportunities for microbes to move through the soil. So microbial communities are expected to be uh, more similar in soil that is sampled from locations that are close to each other uh, compared with soil that is sampled from locations that are further away. So what I'm showing in this kind of complicated looking figure is similarity in viral communities. So the further up this axis, uh, the more similar the communities are. And of course, the further down, the more different they are. And I'm basically how similarity relates to distance between sample plots. So the further away the samples were, the more their viral communities uh, differed. And at 18 meters uh, apart, in fact, the communities were almost completely distinct. Fertilization also plays a major role in shaping virus communities. So what this figure shows, um, each of these circles represents a um, viral community from a specific uh, sample site. And the ones that are red represent samples that were um, conventionally fertilized. And the ones shown in blue represent uh, samples that were fertilized using uh, organic fertilizer. And basically what this shows is that the fertilizer uh, used had a tremendous impact on the uh, viral communities. Um, this is significant from the perspective of predators uh, because different viruses are probably killing uh, different bacteria. And so we need to examine how different fertilizers, uh, as well as other ways we treat the soil, um, can impact predators when considering how to use uh, microbial predators to control pathogens. Um, so the next group of predators I will discuss are predatory bacteria. Um, these are bacteria that actually feed on other bacteria. And there's two groups of predatory bacteria that we're uh, interested in. So the first are known as mixobacteria. And the reason I'm showing a picture of wolves um, hunting a, a bison here is mixobacteria kind of use a similar method to uh, wolves in that they pack hunt their bacterial prey. Um, so basically the prey represented um, here by the bison um, so yeah, what's shown here on the left are mixobacteria, and this is a streak of prey bacteria. And what's happening here is the mixobacteria are moving up the streak of prey. Um, they're basically finding, you know, they, they, they found the prey and they're signaling to the other uh, mixobacteria that, you know, hey, there's, there's food here. Um, and they're moving along the prey, uh, breaking open the bacterial cells and using the contents of the prey as food. So once they find the prey and consume it, they then form um, what are known as mixosporms. There's mixospores, excuse me. Um, these allow uh, the bacteria to uh, survive until they're able to find new bacterial prey. Um, so, this is another uh, group of predatory bacteria, which works in a different way from the mixobacteria. Uh, these bacteria are known as uh, Delovibrio, and how they work is they infect bacteria kind of like in a similar way to viruses. Uh, they multiply inside the bacterial host, and then they uh, rupture uh, the cells, and um, then the freshly made bacteria go and attack other prey. Uh, so on the right, there's two images of Delo Vibrio uh, bacteria attacking uh, bacterial pathogens. Um, so down here, this is Pseudomonas, um, which is a common plant pathogen. While up here, this is an image of uh, Delo Vibrio attacking E. coli, which is a human pathogen. Um, and while I have this slide up, I just wanted to emphasize that we're not just interested in controlling uh, plant pathogens. Uh, we're also interested in um, controlling bacteria that might contaminate uh, produce and um, other agricultural products. You know, so two of the most common uh, foodborne um, 
pathogens uh, on organic crops are E. coli and salmonella, uh, both of which can be deadly and are often introduced to the plants uh, through contaminated irrigation. And predators such as Della Vibrio can be used to uh, control these pathogens and um, improve pre-harvest uh, food safety. So next I'm going to talk about our area of expertise, uh, which are the protists. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, uh, protists are single cell like bacteria, but they're more closely related to animals, uh, plants and fungi. Um, this is just a, a graphic, it's a protist tree of life, just showing how different um, organisms are related to each other. So you have your animals, your fungi, and your plants, and everything else um, on this graphic is considered to be a protist. They're a hugely diverse group. Um, they're numerous in soil. Um, you'll find approximately 10,000 or more individuals per gram of soil. And they're relevant to plants and soils in a number of different ways. So for example, some of them are pathogens. Um, however, the majority of protists are actually predators of bacteria. And before moving on, I just wanted to show some close-up photos of protists uh, to give you all an idea of what they look like. Uh, so you can see how much they vary in, in appearance. Uh, they also vary uh, tremendously in their behavior, uh, as well as their feeding styles, and in some cases, the um, prey that they feed on. Now, protists have played a major role in shaping what bacteria survive in the soil. Um, so they have been eaten by um, they've been eaten by um, sorry bacteria have been eaten by uh, protists for hundreds of millions of years. And as a result, many have developed a wide variety of methods to avoid being eaten, uh, which we refer to as uh, predation resistance, and as this animation will show. So this guy here represents the uh, protist, and oh, those bacteria are too big to be eaten, uh, while others are too fast. Um, others still produce chemicals, and these chemicals will uh, prevent the bacteria from being eaten. But up here are some susceptible ones, which the protists will happily, um, happily munch on. And um, as a result, when protists are uh, present, predation-resistant bacteria, such as the sort of uh, fluorescent bacteria that are busy multiplying, um, will thrive and benefit while susceptible uh, bacteria are eaten. So in the context of plant and soil health, the ability of protists and other predators to reshape bacterial communities uh, can improve plant and uh, soil and plant health if predation resistant uh, bacteria are beneficial. Now in relation to crops, it's been shown that protists can have a large impact on uh, interactions between microbes and plants, and that management practices uh, can cause shifts in these interactions. So for example, recent research uh, comparing the impact of different fertilizers showed that cucumbers fertilized with a, a bioorganic fertilizer. So that's an organic fertilizer that contained uh, trigoderma, uh, which is a, a fungus that promotes uh, plant growth, had greater yields than plants fertilized by no fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, or organic fertilizer alone. And when the researchers took a closer look at what impact the fertilizers are having on the soil microbiomes, they discovered that the impact of the uh, protist community, so basically what protists were present uh, in the soil sample, actually explained um, most of the difference in crop yields more than even bacteria or fungi. So this suggests that protists can impact plant growth, uh, possibly through interactions with other uh, microbes. And another way in which protists can benefit plants is by benefiting uh, pathogen suppressing bacteria. So in this study, um, 
what they did was they inoculated plants with different concentrations of a protist. So you have your control where there was no protist inoculum all the way up to the, uh, the highest amount that was um, added to the, uh, the, to the soil. And what they discovered was by increasing the concentration of a bacteria eating protist, they actually reduced the concentration of the uh, fungal pathogen Fusarium octisporum. And it turned out that selective feeding by the uh, protist was actually promoting the growth of uh, bacillus, which is a predation resistant um, bacterial species that uh, suppresses uh, Fusarium. So now the final group I'll cover here are the nematodes. And uh, nematodes, as I mentioned before, are microscopic worms that inhabit the soil. And although many nematodes um, you might be familiar with are plant pathogens, almost half of the nematodes present in soil are actually predators of uh, bacteria. Uh, so currently we have 129 described species of bacteria feeding nematodes, but this is probably a major uh, underestimation. Uh, bacteria eating nematodes can have a huge impact on plant and soil health. So one of the main um, impacts is they can move bacteria through the soil. And this includes bacteria that are uh, present on the outside, as well as on the inside uh, that are um, released through defecation. This movement greatly contributes to the uh, decomposition of uh, plant material in soil. So basically plants die, uh, and then they, begin, they, they, they start to decompose thanks to uh, microbes. And what nematodes do is they help the process by mixing bacteria with the plant material. Um, and they can actually contribute as much as 40% of the total decomposition. Um, Another way in which nematodes can um, impact plant and soil health is through uh, nitrogen cycling. So in the presence of uh, nitrogen, or sorry, in the presence of nematodes, <laughs> there's significantly a, a greater amount of nitrogen uh, present in the soil compared to uh, when the nematodes are absent. So when there's a high abundance of predatory uh, nematodes, there's a, a greater capacity for uh, nutrient cycling. So now I've covered all the major groups of uh, microbial predators studied within, within our group. And I wanted to, to once again emphasize that although these are very unique groups of predators, there's a lot of overlap in uh, how they interact with uh, soil and plants. So for example, with the, the nitrogen cycling and nutrient cycling I just mentioned with the nematodes, it's also been shown that protists contribute to uh, nutrient cycling. <laughs> excuse me, uh, quite a bit. Um, in addition, fertilizer regimes, they don't only impact viruses and protists, they've also been shown to uh, impact the uh, mixobacterial communities. But um, one of the benefits of this uh, collaboration is we have been able to learn from each other and use uh, methods that apply to one system to uh, study um, other uh, pre uh, predators of bacteria. Um, we've also, we're also uh, planning to take a look at um, combinations of different predators to look for synergistic impacts. So uh, to see if combinations of different predators can have complementary or perhaps detrimental impacts on uh, the control of pathogens. So when we think about microbial predators of uh, bacteria, we have a number of questions we would like to answer. Um, so for example, we would like to know if we can find inoculants for biological control uh, that can survive longer in the soil. Uh, we want to find uh, beneficial bacteria uh, that are resistant to uh, predation in soil that will last longer if applied. Um, we're also interested in figuring out if there are ways to activate predators. So for example, if a plant or human pathogen is uh, introduced into the soil, is there a way of stimulating the soil predators to specifically prey on those uh, pathogens? 
Uh, we also want to know what predators are associated with healthy plants. Um, and if this is an indication of whether or not your plants will be healthy. Similarly, uh, we would like to be able to predict the likelihood of certain diseases um, based on the presence or abundance of certain predators in your soil. And finally, we'd like to use our knowledge of microbial predators to optimize nutrient cycling. Okay, so uh, I've reached the end of, uh, of, of our presentation here. Um, I wanted to thank you all for your time. Um, and I'd like to finish off by conducting one final survey. Uh, and this should, take, uh, this should take less than a minute uh, to get through. Um, but basically, we want to hear from you. You know, what did you learn from, from my presentation? Um, and are there any burning questions you have about microbial predators? You know, what would you like to know about them? What pathogens are you most concerned about? Um, and once everyone's finished uh, this final survey, uh, I'll open up the floor for any questions, comments, ideas for research uh, you'd like to see our group conduct. Um, and I, I will do my very best to uh, answer them. Um, and uh, Devin, uh, if you could share the second uh, survey, I would greatly appreciate it. All right, and I'll, yeah, in, in a minute from now, I will um, open up uh, the floor to, to uh, questions. Thank you very much. All right. All right. So a few questions in the chat from earlier during the presentation. Christine asked, have you studied how these interrelationships work in soils that are not being managed for agriculture, as in forest soils? Um, so we haven't uh, uh, specifically. Um, there is a little bit of uh, work that's been done on uh, some groups of um, some groups of these uh, microscopic predators uh, in forest soil. So, uh, for example, um, with protists, uh, there's been a little bit of work done um, looking at the diversity of these protists as well as the um, impacts on um, uh, nutrient cycling. Uh, but certainly, you know, certainly that is. Uh, an, an area of interest uh, as well. We've got Scott. He's curious about microarthropods, if they're a part of the study. And also, are there practices that will increase the predators in their soil? Any specific practices or applications that they can intentionally make to just build the predator population? Yeah, so the, the question about uh, the microarthropods, uh, it's a great question. Um, so I um, earlier in the year attended, um, attended uh, or I gave a similar presentation at the uh, Connecticut uh, NOFA meeting. And there were quite a few questions asked about um, the, uh, about mites. Um, so, at, at, at this point, we don't have anyone in, in our group that is a, a mite expert, but um, that is something we've uh, discussed about bringing in um, and, um, and and looking uh, looking at. Um, and then 
Um, as far as uh, what practices can be done to in increase the uh, the predators, um, we want to, you know, so, so this is something, you know, we, we, we don't know at this point and we, we want to uh, figure out. Um, one of the important things to uh, remember is certain certain predators, we, we, we expect that certain predators are going to be really beneficial. Um, there's also certain predators that we probably um, want to keep out. Um, so one example is uh, there are certain protists um, which can actually act as almost Trojan horses uh, for some bad bacteria. Um, so protists do this thing called um, insisting, uh, where they basically form a, a protective, um, basically it's like a protective shell uh, to protect themselves from uh, bad uh, conditions. And it's been shown that um, certain um, human pathogens can actually get, you know, they'll, they'll do fine if they're inside of a uh, insisted uh, protist. And then um, when the protist is active, then the uh, bacteria can be released and contaminate uh, whatever environment they're released into. So uh, it's a very, very important consideration that we want, you know, the good predators uh, basically uh, to be promoted. Insisting sounds so courteous for such a Trojan horse kind of action. <laughs> um, I don't mean for me to just read the questions from the chat. So if anybody, please show your faces. Let's hear your voices. If you have more questions, feel free to raise a hand and we'll call you out. Um, Heidi also asks, are predators always beneficial? Mm. Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, ba basically, you know, to 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 follow up on on the uh, the previous the, the on the previous question, um, they probably aren't always going to be uh, beneficial. Um, so yeah, we definitely want to find the ones that um, specifically control pathogens of interest, or the ones that really uh, promote the growth of the of the really good bacteria, um, and, and and fungi. Uh, there's a lot of uh, predators that feed on. Uh, on fungi as well. And um, this is something else that we've also been looking into. So I've got one. Um, you asked what we would want from y'all as a team of researchers and soil scientists. And I'd love a prescription. If, if you could analyze my situations, you know, hypothetically, if I have a soil borne disease in my field or if I'm having issues with certain microbiological activities. Um, love to see just general cocktail prescriptions. Hey, if you're dealing with this, plant this because it increases fill in the blank. And I guess my question would be, are there any super hosts? Are there any classes of plants or specific plants or families that uh, seem to just aggregate all the good and less of the bad, all the beneficial and less of the troublesome? Mm. That's a really good question. And um you know, I I too I would definitely love to be able to um, you know prescribe a great combination of uh, microbes um, and also to know what particular plants might attract um, like you were asking what particular plants might um, attract um, a you know perfectly good group of um, beneficial bacteria and or good, you know, microbial predators. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, we, we just don't know um, enough about that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, wish, I wish I could give a, 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 a concrete answer um, to you here, but, um, but yeah, this, five this, years. This, this is one of the, uh, this is definitely one of the things, you know, we want to be able to come out of this with a lot more knowledge about this, so. The sage Stephanie Harris from New Jersey wants to know how viable are commercially available predators like beneficial nematodes? Do they survive from one season to the next? Do they survive shipping? Can you can you touch upon you know some of these labs that'll ship you out nematodes and other beneficials? Okay, well, I so the the nematodes I I don't know too much about. Um, it's it's not really my so, so unfortunately, I can't really comment much about the ones that are uh, shipped out. 
Um, I know survivability. So from the from the protus side, um, you know, um, there there's definitely uh, you know some question about you know we've had some um, protus that we've inoculated soil with and. Many weeks later, we detect them, they're thriving, they're doing great. Um, others will inoculate and we won't be able to uh, detect them. And it's not always clear why. Um, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, as far as the nematodes are concerned, I, I, I can't really say much about uh, their, their year to year um, survivability. Uh, but obviously, yeah, if there was something that you could inoculate one time and it, be retained in the soil for many seasons, that would be, that would be really, you know, that would be ideal. Awesome. Scott has a comment. Uh, the utility of a cell phone app or other quick read device that would help them know what changes to the soil need to be made. You know, if your plants are showing specific, uh, maybe, uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the term. If they're showing signs of disease, mm -hmm. uh, there could be correlated advice given or, you know, diagnoses and again, prescriptions for what to do. I think that would help a lot of growers that don't have the time to dig into this research at such a depth, but we need, you know, we're willing to take action and we just need guidance based on the specific context. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've tried using uh, you know, just just tested out some of these uh, apps before, and yeah, I mean, they they they, they seem to be you know inter like they, they're interesting for sure. Um, you know, and I think yeah, there, there's there's usually um, why am I uh, blinking on the name? But there are you know uh, diagnostics. There there, there are people uh, specifically go out to you know look at um, pathogen problems. Uh, there are also very uh, useful resources. You know, here at the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, we uh, actually have a uh, plant disease um, um, diagnostic um, clinic. Basically, people bring in um, their their plants that that where things are growing on them, um, or they look unhealthy. And um, yeah, so, so, so there there are a lot of these uh, really useful uh, ways to uh, you know look at and diagnose your um, plant uh, pathogen problems or plant health problems in general. During your research, were there any kind of real surprises or off the wall discoveries you stumbled upon, or anything that made you think I need to dig into that the next go around, or I need to write a grant to get some more research funding for whatever that thing was. Was there anything out of the ordinary that you stumbled upon? Uh, definitely. You know, one thing um, with the, the protus research. So, you know, we primarily uh, set out to find um, what protists are present in soil, what protists are enriched by uh, plants. Um, so one thing that, you know, plants do is they release a lot of um, sugar into the uh, surrounding soil, like uh, carbohydrates and you know other nutrients into the soil, to That's kind of attract their um, microbiome. And um, you know, so one of the sort of unexpected, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was entirely unexpected, but it was a really interesting finding was, you know, a lot of protists um, actually. So they carry around their own bacterial microbiome. Um, so that's basically they have bacteria living on their their outside, you know, living around them, living on their inside. And those microbes that are carried around by them can actually, if we inoculate plants with them, have a really huge impact. So it's not just you know bacteria that are separately inoculated onto the plant, but the bacteria brought by the protists themselves can have a huge impact on what bacteria end up taking over the, um, the, the environment, the rhizosphere, the environment around the, uh, the plant roots. Um, so yeah, so we're actually you know, looking into that, uh, digging into that a little bit further. Multi-dimensional inoculation. Absolutely. <laughs>
I know you're on a tight time schedule. Do you have a few more minutes with us? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, if anyone has any more questions. I've got one. And mm -hmm. this is more of a human question. How did you get into all this? What's your background? What made you study soil science and protists and microbes? And uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I actually came from a um, forest entomology background. So I used to study um, insects that uh, kill trees. And um, during my, my doctorate, um, I was basically became interested in beetle um, fungus symbiosis. So um, many of you might be familiar with the mountain pine beetle, um, which is it's killing uh, a lot of pine trees in Western uh, North America. And um, on the East Coast, there's the Southern Pine Beetle, um, which has been uh, once again killing pine trees uh, in, in and across uh, Eastern North America. It's, it's recently, because of climate change, its uh, range has actually expanded um, up to Long Island and uh, even in Connecticut. Um, and these beetles have close associations with fungi. And so, yeah, I basically was interested in these, you know, symbiotic interactions. Um, then I discovered, I, I didn't discover, uh, I became interested in um, protists because a lot of insects carry around protists. And um, I then started to kind of delve into the fascinating world of protists uh, in general. Um, and realized that we don't really know much about protists and their interactions with uh, plants beyond, um, beyond the plant pathogens. Um, so with all these groups of microbes that I've been talking about, most of what we know um, about these groups are the pathogens. And that's of course, because those are the ones that most directly and obviously um, affect us. Um, but there are a lot of, um, yeah, a, a lot of potentially beneficial um, microorganisms. I mean, a lot of beneficial and, and like the so potentially beneficial microorganisms that we just don't know about. So that's really what interested me was like, hey, there's this group of microorganisms that we really don't know much about at all, but they're everywhere. And yeah, I was just interested in seeing what what impact they have on um, on plants. It's like exploring the depths of the ocean. You'll never learn it all. It keeps you keeps you interested. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you know, you, you talk about uh, oceans. That's actually where most of our um, the pr protists are all over the uh, the ocean. So most of what we know about protists in general is from um, oceans and also freshwater systems. Awesome, anybody else in the chat? Anybody else in attendance wanna hop on before we start to close things down? I see Mabel. So these were just sort of curiosity questions. Um, the mixobacteria that we're mm -hmm. gathering around and eating, so were they little and were they eating one big bacteria? Um, so as far as the size, so, so they were eating um, a colony of bacteria. Um, so it's not quite like, um, you know, when it, so when it comes to the size ranges, um, that's also, so yeah, the, so, the, so the, the predatory bacteria is also not really my area of expertise, but I think the, like, like, like the, the wolf pack, um, so yeah, so I can't really talk about the size differences, but mm -hmm. as far as the, um, like the reason we had the wolf pack picture up was mainly because of the way the, the mixobacteria communicate with each other. Um, so they actually, they find prey and then they communicate with each other and they say, all right, here's a group of uh, prey bacteria. And then they move in and they start uh, taking them down. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then, you had this graph that was showing the different viromes 
uh, for conventional and organic mm. fertilizer. I didn't understand what the axes were at, at all. Were those sure. numbers of something or other? Or, or let what me, yeah, let me just bring, um, so I just wanna make sure. Okay, yeah, let me just um, pull the, um, Oh, whoops. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, right here. So, oh, that is, sorry, just give me one second. Sure. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Um, so the, you're talking about this figure here? Yep. Okay, so this is this is one of those kind of complicated statistics things. Um, <laughs> basically, what this is, um, it's known as a principal coordinate analysis. And basically, what it is, is it takes really complicated data sets and breaks it down, tr basically tries to simplify it as much as possible. Um, so what you have here are these two axes. Um, so the principal component one, basically th that's the bottom axis. Uh, let me just get the laser pointer out. This basically just explains most of the observed variation. And um, yeah, basically what matters here is the conventional and the organic fertilizers group separately. Um, so from this, we can tell that um, the fertilizer use, def use definitely drives uh, the differences between the, uh, the two uh, fertilizer regimes. Um, it doesn't necessarily say, you know, anything more specific than that, just that there is a large difference and about a quarter of the uh, variance is explained uh, by the fertilizer that's used. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that, if that helps. Um, so, um, so basically the fact that the, the organic stuff is further over to the right is not significant. It's not saying like, this is better or something. Exactly. Exactly. All, all it's really saying is that they're different. Okay. That's yep. good. Thank you so much. This is yeah, uh, very enlightening. You're very welcome. This was a really awesome talk, and I want to just second a comment that I saw earlier in the chat. The visuals really were great. They helped. The little cartoons, they were awesome. Okay, Thank amazing. For that as well. Is that all you? Oh, no, no, no. Um, the, the, uh, so, I, actually, I can't, I can't, I was, I was going to, I was going to say the, the protest graphics were, were mine. Actually, the animation was made by, uh, by Lindsay. Um, and many of the, most of the other figures, um, came from published papers, um, or were provided by our, uh, collaborators. Cool. So, yeah, it's, it's a big, big, uh, team effort to put this, uh, together. We thank you for all the effort. Any last words, any final thoughts, anyone from the audience? And if not from you, Stephen? Um, I'm actually just going to, um, post my, uh, email address here. Um, if anyone um, would like to send any follow-up questions or uh, anything along those lines. Um, oh, oops. Ah, thank you so much. I didn't realize I just direct uh, messaged you, uh, Devin. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, Paul, any other comments? We really appreciate you taking the time to share your, your work with us and everything that you're discovering. If you can please keep on sharing it with the NOFA universe, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and everybody else in the in the uh, in the room here, please go to that virtual auction. Don't uh, bid on some awesome, awesome products and baskets and bundles and experiences. And please fill out that session evaluation survey. There's two links in the chat. I'll go ahead, copy and paste them both again, just in case you need to see them. But Stephen, thank you so much for your time. This was great. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Devin. Um, 
for 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 um, yeah, helping uh, basically making this possible. And um, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, this is an absolute pleasure. So I hope you all enjoy uh, yeah the rest of the uh, the rest of the conference. We'll definitely do. All right, everyone. We'll see you in the rest of the conference tomorrow, Saturday, and just tomorrow and Saturday. Listen, day. All right. Good night, y'all. Good night, everyone.